There she is. I don't know why she's trying to hide. We've been playing a ball. You know, you must appease the associate pastor. There's her ball laying. Do you see it? Appease the associate pastor. Keep your people happy. Right, Suze? That's what we do. We keep our people happy. You keep the associate pastor happy. You hear all the noise? Hi, Larry. I got the dehumidifiers cranking. Trying to get ahead of the very humid week we have out there now. Supposed thunderstorms and the like. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. If you can't hear me because of all the noise, I got that ugly whatever, you know, air conditioners, fans, all of that stuff going on. But it's necessary. It's necessary because it's a big old room and there's nothing else, you know, that's helping out with all of the humidity. So we got to get on top of it, right? Got to get on top of it. Got to get on top of a lot of things, like keeping Susie happy. It's what we do. Susie is scheduled uh, to sit with the Commission on Credentialing and Placement in a couple of months. She's going to have her licensing exam. She knows just as much as I do. There's no doubt about that. Thank you, Barb. She knows how to love a lot better than I do. You know, dog is God spelled backwards. Just saying. Lord, thank you. Thank you for Tuesday morning. Here we are, Father God. Checking in with you. Checking in with each other. In your name. Lord, guide us this day. Here for turning on the lights and guide us in our lives, Lord, because you are the light of the world. And we give ourselves over to you in Jesus' name. Let us be your church this day and worship you and bless you in your holy name. Amen. I just love this altar. It, it bothers me that we have to we put the screen down. Now, we've been doing it for years and it's, I believe, necessary because we read a lot of scripture and people get a lot of scripture, but it covers that beautiful scene. What I would like to do is replace that with a large monitor. And that way we can keep that up and we can replace that with a large electronic monitor that everything could be projected on, you see. I guess it's not projected if it's on a monitor, but you know what I'm saying. And we can save this setup for movies and things of that like. But that way we would be able to worship with the altar of the Lord intact. Good morning, Sharon. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Turning on the Lights. There she is again, digging out her toys, digging out her animals. She's going to have a good day, I can tell you right now. I'm going to have a good day, I can tell you right now. Every day with the Lord is a good day. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness gracious. Father, we know that you've got this uh, under control. We pray that you would control the pain and that you would make the diagnosis swift and the care absolutely complete. So total healing is achieved in Jesus name. Amen. Good morning, Miss Bryn. How are you? I am here in the Churchtown Church of God with my little iPhone, uh, thinking about a lot of different things this morning, everything from uh, how to jump ahead of the humidity this week and make the sanctuary very comfortable for worship to uh, the freedom that we have in Christ. That's where my brain is stuck right now. Um, the idea, I've been going through Romans. If you've been checking out the radio station, there's a continuation of the preaching here that I've been following in terms of the fundamental truths. Like when we get down to the bare essence of what does it mean to follow Christ, we've been talking about, one, the truth of Scripture. 
I want to do another um, session, if you will, another week on the authority of Scripture. Do you hear her? I thought you were playing with your toys. You're done playing with your toys? Hold on. So we talked about some of the things that are there in Scripture that, yes, we can ignore them if we so choose, but we ignore them at the peril of disavowing the authority of Scripture. It is better to wrestle with the words of the text. It is better to wrestle with the Word of God and come out the other side with a more nuanced, and sometimes not. Sometimes it is nuanced, sometimes it is cut and dried, but we rest in the authority of Scripture either way. We, we have to do that. We can't just look at the Word of God and then say, yeah, but. That was written 2,500 years ago, and things are different today. Can't argue with that. Both of those statements are true. Neither of those statements negate the authority of Scripture or the validity of what we read, but both are true. <clears throat> so if we take that and make it the truth, so I'm going to take the suggestions of the Word of God and mold them and shape them so that I can apply them appropriately to today's culture. Woo, baby, that's thin ice. It's thin ice for individuals who still profess sola scriptura, right? Christ alone, grace alone, scripture alone. What do we do with that? So that's kind of where I've been. And so the natural progression of that, we talk about life in the spirit. And what does that mean? Yeah, I wish that we had, uh, I wish that we could have a solution that, you know, we could, that, that we, we just move something. But it covers the whole altar. You know, the stained glass, the candles. It looks silly if you've ever seen it. I go up under the screen and light the candles that nobody's going to see. For a while, anyway, till we put it up. But it... At the same token, by the same token, like I said, the, the worship songs that we sing are wonderful and the scripture that we place up, you know, people read and that has over the years and building that culture prompted a Bible reading church. Imagine that. So uh, there's no way I'm going to say, you know, just for the for one sake or the other, right? I've had many people say, I've, I've never read this much scripture and it's just on Sunday morning. And then of course you, you promote and you prompt and you encourage individuals to be in the word throughout the course of the week. So I'm balancing that. There's also significant, you know, painting and repairs and remodeling sorts of things that need to be done um, and so I don't know if we can invest in that electronic system right now. So they're balancing a lot of different things. Project them where? The wall space. You know, I was thinking of that, and that's what they did back even before the projector. There was one of those old... Um, not an opaque projector, but what were they called, you know, where you have the magnifying and it shoots it like teachers would use it all the time, whatever. But they would project it on the wall there where the picture is and then take the paper off and put a new paper on. Um, transparencies, that sort of thing. Right. Hmm. All good suggestions. Maybe there is just a more overhead projector. Yeah, that was it. Good morning, Miss April. Long time no here. How are you, my dear? Um, maybe there is a more practical solution like that. You know what I'm saying? Um, we'll think about it. We'll think about it. Good morning, Mr. Mark. My dear, how are you? 
I don't want to be sexist here. Good morning, Mark, my dear. Morning. So yeah, we're, you know, that's where we're, we're going with the, the teaching and the preaching here. Fundamental realities that maybe we skip over, so to speak. The fundamental reality is scripture is inspired, right? By the, by the very breath of God. If you don't believe that, then all bets are off, so to speak. If you, if you don't believe that, then what are you doing? Oh, of course, Dennis, my dear. See what I'm saying? So oftentimes as Christians, we find ourselves in these insane, irrational conversations. And we ourselves don't realize that we are discussing Scripture from the point of view that it is inspired. It is God-breathed. And the other person does not. And so we can say, yes, 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 look at this, look at this, read this, read this, read this. And it means nothing because they, the individual has not even come to the point where they believe that Scripture is the Word of God. It's a book. And of course, the enemy has done his best to create all kinds of sometimes very rational lies, even about the word of God. I had this conversation not too long ago, not too long ago. So before the Reformation, you're telling me that the word of God was maintained in the one true holy Catholic church. Yes, it was. And you're trying to tell me that the same holy Catholic church that has having these innumerable, disgusting, horrible, it's as corrupt as the day is long. And I'm supposed to believe that somehow they never manipulated any of these texts. Yes, I am. <laughs> Rational, logical. There's a lot of inference there. And you have to assume all of those things are also true. But can you see where the individual is coming from? How am I supposed to trust this church? Have you read the headlines? And now we move through the Reformation and you see the church, headline after headline after headline, fallen person after fallen person after fallen church after fallen church, greedy, selfish, self-indulgent, fleets of private jets, all of those different things. And you're supposed, all through it all, through it all, you're supposed to, you're telling me that the word of God has been preserved. Yes, I am. I just go back to that Tony Campolo quote, right? What do I do with the church? The church is a whore, but she's my mother, right? It's, it's difficult. It is, there are so many... But yes, I believe that the Holy Bride of Christ has preserved the Word of God through the generations. And I think that when we go to textual criticism and we find the historical, we, we see that. We have more proof texts of Scripture than any other historical text. And they prove to be very, 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 very accurate. When the Dead Sea Scrolls came along, it really, really confirmed that the translations that we have through the generations and the translations, the translation, the word that the church has preserved through the generations, it's been legit. God has worked through the corruption of the church to preserve the word of God. Boom. Okay. I honestly didn't read that before that, but it's, that's what I'm saying. So there we go. So we talk about those sorts of things, a fundamental truth that the word of God is the word of God, not just accurate, not just historically accurate, not just verbatim according to the ancient scriptures, but the word of God, the inspired God breathed word of God. We, we live our lives on that premise. So when the psalmist says, you knew me from conception through birth, 
There it is. When, the, when we read the historical and spiritual account of the, of the incarnation of the Christ, and the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and in you will be grown, right? In you will be conceived. Then we know human beings are human. There's never not a time that human beings are not human beings. What do we, there it is. Now we can say ancient texts, different times. Now we have civil law and choice. And you can argue all around it all, of you, all you want. But we must wrestle through it. And ultimately we must choose. Because that brings us to the next point, right? We have freedom. We as free moral agents have freedom. The scripture speaks about this very, very clearly in Romans, in 1 Corinthians, in Galatians, in the Psalms. And we are taught by Paul, it's in 1 Peter 1, 16, 2, 16. The freedom that we have in Christ, use it well. Use it well. Right? We also want to take that concept and polarize it. We don't have any freedom in Christ. Everything is predetermined. I'm either saved or I'm not according to the will of God. I don't know, but I'm told that I should behave and act like I am, just in case I am. I don't have freedom, I don't want freedom, I don't want any of that responsibility. It's all predetermined. I have freedom, total freedom, and that means that this is a gift of God, this freedom, so I have the freedom to choose and to do whatever I want to do. And, and the whole idea of whatever I choose is biblical because I have freedom. You see what I'm saying? We want to polarize super conservative, uh, even predeterministic to ultra liberal freedom is the gift of God that I have and I determine everything in my life. One second, please. Crying little baby. But we're, we're taught, we're taught the middle ground. We're taught we have freedom in Christ and we are cautioned, use it well. Because we're taught that not everything, like we're free to choose all kinds of different things that may feel good or even be good, but they are not according to God's will. And we, we need to be careful with that, right? We need to think through this. We need to pray. We need to discern. We need to exercise our freedom to love God and love neighbor. And so this... Again, it seems as though Christ never lets us land in a place where we don't have to engage with him. He, he just will not allow us to polarize. He gives us fundamental truths in the word of, word of God. Boom, my feet are firmly planted on that truth. But now as I engage with him in this journey of Christianity, of following, of discipleship, as I engage as a disciple with culture, man, I've got things to do. I've got things to think about. I've got ways of, you know, thinking, discernment, prayer. There's just no level on which he does not allow for our engagement with the text, right? With the word of God and with him. But we, you know, we want something simpler than that. And so we polarize. We liturgize. Is that a word? Right? Instead of church being a place where people can engage, we close all of that off. We have a liturgy that begins at 11 a.m. sharp and ends at 11 59 59 sharp and there is no room there is no room for people to engage 
So let me read what you're saying here. Hi, Chris. Even though we all know King James Version descended from, oh, I got that. Make America King James again. Is it not a sign, is that right? All, all of that. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and there, there you go. Like I said, the, uh, uh, but we, we can't get into a, can I know you're not, Mark. I'm just saying we can't jump into that camp. And to, you know, we're, we're, we have to engage with Scripture and, and discern and do the, do the work of wrestling with Scripture. Man learned the most foundational science from the Bible, things that weren't verified as man. Exactly. Theology what is the queen, right? The mother of all sciences. It's how it used to be known. Theology was the queen of all sciences uh, and also called the mother of all sciences. Hi, Michelle. So there you go. That's what I'm thinking about today. And I understand that some of you may be trying to write comments and they're not coming through. Some of you may be trying to read the comments and not seeing any of the comments come through. Um, I don't know what's up with that with Facebook. So, uh, you know, I've heard many comments from, I think, last Thursday or Friday on about, hey, this is all messed up. And yeah, it is. It has been. So hoping that they get it all worked out, but people's comments and then... So last night when I went through them and I responded and that sort of thing, which I like to do sometimes before I go to sleep and see, review the conversation for the day and, and you know, where my scripture readings have taken me for the day. Um, some of them said this comment is hidden and I had to tap it and then it would say unhide comment. And I, I, so I don't, I don't get all of that. But so if you're trying to comment or if you're not seeing them, I'm sorry. It's not my fault, um, and that's that. So. so that's where we are. Let me read this for you. Because I was in First Peter to begin with. It is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. Yeah, weird. For you are free, yet you are God's slaves. You want to talk about having to wrestle with Scripture? We, we take words like that, statements like that, for granted. For you are free yet you are God's slaves. In the secular world, in, in the, the world outside of God's holy church and outside of relationship with our Redeemer, those two things are mutually exclusive. Christ is asking us to break down that very rational thought process of those two things being mutually exclusive and wrestle with what it means for them to be integrated. You cannot be both slave and free at the same time, or can you? Right? And that, that, that's what I'm talking about, how scripture, how, how God's holy word draws us into engage with it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Everything that I've read and uh, the history texts and, and, and secular texts and all of those, you cannot be a free slave. Well, the Lord says you can. And if we believe that this is the, indeed the inspired word of God, then we must come to terms and figure out what does he mean by you are a free slave or you are a slave that is free. Because in the secular world, those things are mutually exclusive. In the word of God, he is drawing parallels and saying that, no, they are actually integrated. And again, it's a, it's a more complicated, more nuanced teaching than just that bold. And I'm going to finish reading that. 
Um, Paul talks a, a lot about this. How can you be slave and free? And the premise of it, the premise of that discussion is that we choose. We are drawn to worship. That can be idol worship. That can be God worship. But wherever we lay our hearts, we will become slaves of that. So we have the freedom to walk into bondage. What? Right? This is crazy. But there it is. We have the freedom to walk into bondage. And he's saying, bond yourself to Christ Jesus. Like Paul lays it out there in the middle of Romans. Why would you bond yourself to the old self? Why would you bond yourself to sin and death? Bond yourself to righteousness through Christ Jesus. If you're going to become a slave, do not become a slave to sin. Become a slave to righteousness. The premise of that is the way we are constructed and the way that we will worship and we are drawn to worship. We are made to worship, but we have the freedom to worship the next thing we see if we so choose. So it's an interesting premise. It is an interesting wording. It is complex. It makes us think. Like I said, the Word of God is constructed and written such that we can zoom right through it. We can zoom right through a statement like that. Or we can go, what? It's made for us to go, what? And engage. What do you mean by that, Lord? And your initial reaction may be, I don't want to be a slave of yours any more than I want to be a slave over here. What are you talking about? Good. Have that reaction. Then go inside the word and figure out what he is saying. Right? And, and move from 1 Peter to Romans to Galatians to Corinthians and, and, and explore this discussion of freedom. Use it well. See what I'm saying? What? Hi, Logan. Oh, Dennis, I see. It's a sprain. Yeah, but you, my, it was weird. Okay, what is here? The other day, I could write comments on my phone, not on my laptop. I'm using a PC. It works fine. Bizarre. Bizarre technology, gremlins. Thanks for your, it's a sprain, rest, good, 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 stay off it. Ice and Advil, Liz, are you there? Ice, Advil, elevation. Ice, Advil, elevation. I wish I had a dime. I wish I, see, if I had a dollar, seriously, for every time I heard Ice, Advil, elevation, I'd probably go out and buy a new car today. Ah, you know, I was watching that thing that Jim Grove posted about two baseball players doing dad jokes, delivering dad jokes to one another. And I thought, that's kind of baseball, right? Like baseball is a big dad joke. Like, look, this is a sport. <laughs> I'm just saying. Through the Holy... Thank you. That's probably the piece that I left out. Because we're not taught, right, in our own, like, rational understanding. We sit and we pray and we submit to the will of God and God's Holy Spirit. Who is the great comforter? Who is the great advocate? Who is the great teacher? He will lead you in all truth, we learn in the Gospel of John. What? What? He will lead us in all truth. He will lead us to and through the inspired word of God, and he will help us draw up what the Lord is teaching us. Whoo, good point. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah. But you're using the exact language, right, that I'm saying, wow, that's incredible language. God does not force us to be slaves. We have the free will to choose to be slaves. That's crazy. 
Go convince the secular world of that language. That's only possible by the understanding that it is God-breathed and that we are made to go inside this word and by the power of God's Holy Spirit, learn. Good stuff. Right, he gives us the tools, the methodology, the pathway to cope with all circumstances. To, I'll even say, even more than cope, to rise above. Remember, I'm always talking about worldview and this, this expanded worldview that and our happiness is not contingent upon our circumstances. So I would even say we, to rise above, to look at our circumstances from a different perspective. So yeah, again, that's coping with our circumstances differently. But we have the freedom to say, no way, and dive right into our circumstances and absolutely drown and be overwhelmed. So that, I think that's our, what we're saying here today. But that's exactly right, Michelle. It's there for us. It's there for us. The worldview is there, the mechanism, the pathway, the truth, the reality, the rising above is all there for us. Will we walk that path is the question of the day. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Just jumped in the convo. Ooh, that's very millennial of you. The convo. Halfway through, but I'll share that Paul also talks about willingly being slaves to each other. First, boom, we went there. Now we make ourselves slaves to each other. In, well, actually, we didn't go there. We make ourselves slaves to one another. Good point. When we talk about how's that possible, well, or why is that, we're talking about God's holy church. What's the, what, right? We've gone over this a thousand times. What's the difference between the church and the secular world? We are bound together by God's Holy Spirit. Different. So what does that mean? It means that we are bound. We are in bondage. We are bound to one another. Your needs are my needs. Your hurt is my hurt. Your rejoicing is my rejoicing. We are the church. One body, one spirit. Logan! Truth bomb! <laughs> I'm having fun today. Truth bomb! We don't want to hear that either. Your pain is not my pain. I got enough of my own stuff going on. You stay over there in your pew and just whatever. Cry your eyes out. Ask people to pray. I don't care. I've got so much going on. Woo! That's true. You do. But like I used to always teach the football players, if you look, if you, if you're, there's 53 people, say, on this team. If you're just in it for yourself, you've got one person watching your back. You. If you just think in a group mentality, the offensive line, then you have 12, 14 people watching your back, if everybody. But if we as a team come together and we bond with one another and we love and we care and we are motivated as one team toward one goal, then I have, if I give of myself to watch every other back, I've got 52 people watching my back. That's cool. Not exactly church, but you can see the parallel. One body, one spirit. Bond slave bondage is a good translation of that. I agree. I, I, I use the word bonded to and in bondage to differently than more often, I would say, and you've heard me say it today, than slave. Because slave is a, yeah, it, there's a nuance. See, we've got to understand that the Bible speaks about slavery and the New Testament talks about slavery because it addressed culture as it was and there were different levels and forms of slavery and all of these different things but the concept is the same and it's not necessarily the concept of you are stolen and but you are in bondage you are bonded to 
another family, another individual, right? You have pledged yourself to them, thus the laws of such bond you to them to do their bidding at least for a while. So that's a very good point. Ha <laughs> ha, you didn't come through the ranks like I did. One, if I had a dollar for every time that I heard them disregarding my own injuries, I still ice elevate Advil all the time. <laughs> but uh, hearing them from uh, people such as Liz, who came up through the ranks as athletic trainers, you know, what's the prognosis sprain? Ice elevate Advil, you're good to go. Yes, I mean, these are words that we wrestle with, right? I mean, go ahead and start throwing the word bondage out around in secular culture, slavery around in secular culture. And the enemy has done his work. There is no doubt about that. And submission, go ahead and throw the word submission around in secular culture, right? We're taught, and this is where being an American and being taught, you know, like how often as well, I don't even know if the exceptionality of the individual is even taught anymore to young people, but it was to me. The exceptionality of the individual, the ability of the American through the civil liberties that we have to make their own way, all of those things kind of do go against. So, you know, we've got that going on as well. Exactly, exactly. Oh, I want to frame that. I want to frame that. Liz, I was talking about you this morning. Ice, elevate, Advil. Bon there you go, Mark. Mark doing his research. I love it. There's so much good information here. Altruism. You do something for the benefit of others, but with no benefit to yourself. Nice. That is a good toss in there, Dennis. Altruism. Right? You want to draw a parallel between that and sacrificial love. Altruism. You're doing things for the benefit of others, not seeking any of your own benefit. Sacrificial love. And again, if you have... 50 people in this congregation, and we're all committed to that, then yes, I am committed to 49 other people. And I will listen to them, I will walk with them, I will pray for them, over them, with them. I will try to provide for their physical, spiritual, emotional needs. You say, well, that's a lot. I've got 49 people that will do the same for me. That's cool, man. That's church. Like I said, we sat here for... 50 minutes on Sunday and just listen to stories about that. I mean, yeah, we have, not, just, it sounds like a different level or something, but we have all the prayer requests and the, and the pleas for help and those sorts of things. All, and we listen to this, just the stories. There were all stories of mm, fantastic stuff. Rub some dirt on it. You know, Jeff, I, I played high school football in the days when they thought two, two things that were very detrimental to my health and may have led to my current mental state. One, they thought that you could condition yourself like a camel to be dehydrated. And so we actually went through summer practices. We had two six ounce ladles of ice water throughout the course of the practice. We had one water break when we lined up and we drank a ladle, stuck the ladle back in the bucket, next person up, ladle, and we had two of those because you could train yourself through dehydration. Again, may have lent to my current mental state. A little bit. And taking salt tablets. At the same time, they're like, here, 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 here. We're taking salt tablets because we sweat out so much salt, you need to replenish that. I, when I was back in the day too, we have evolved. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. 
I was back in the day too when a kid would walk up to a coach with a dislocated finger, like the knuckle is sticking back there, and the coach would go, boom! You know? <laughs> ah! And then they'd be like, rub some dirt on it, get back in the game. I played a game where I separated my jaw. I separated my jaw against Big Spring. They had me bite, they, oh! And then they had me bite down on a popsicle stick. They're like, okay, you're good to go. I went back in the game. <sighs> well, this was pre-Gatorade or maybe Gatorade was just beginning. I don't know. We were, we're talking. <sighs> I started being the water boy like 76, 77. I played from 78 through 83. So, yeah. Everything was awful. Remember the medical kit? Like it was like a toolbox you'd carry out and the only thing that was in it was smelling salts and salt tablets. You get knocked silly. Like you would be un, and this is not an, I'm not like looking back on the glory days. You'd get knocked silly till you didn't know who you were or you'd get knocked out. They'd drag you off the practice field, prop you up, maybe put some cold water on your head, put a smelling salt under your nose. <laughs> You would wake up, they'd say, take five. Warner, get your helmet on, let's go. Go back in. I played a game in college football. Now it's telling stories. It was the dark ages. I played a game in college football as a freshman. I played on the Frosh team, the freshman sophomore team for California Lutheran College. And we played LA City Community College. We went down there and we played LA City Community College and on the kickoff, I was on the kickoff return team to start the game. And on the kickoff, I can still see, like if this kid had still looked the same today, I could pick him out of a crowd because he was so much faster than I was. I ran back to the kickoff return wedge. I turned around and I looked square in this kid's face. And I see that face right now as clear as if he were standing here because I remember nothing else for two days. He hit me so hard and knocked me out cold on the field on the kickoff return. And I played the entire game. I got up the next day sometime and I don't remember anything until about one o'clock the next afternoon when I woke up with a headache that conquered all headaches of my life. You know what I did next? I went to practice. Dark ages. Okay, there we go, that's a true story. Let's tell stories. It does explain a lot, Dennis. I'm not, I am not, like, like I said, we need to wrestle with the text, not speak around it. This is who I am. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Yes, knock silly is different than being slapped silly. You would much rather be slapped silly than knocked silly. There's your wisdom for the day. Forget all this Bible stuff. Here's your wisdom for the day from Brian. You would much rather be slapped silly than knocked silly. Salt tablets have their place. There, there is thermo tabs over there now because I have traditionally low blood pressure. And thermotabs, especially through the hot, humid months, can help keep my blood pressure up. But they, they're, one, they're not like old-fashioned salt tabs. And two, uh, they're prescribed. You know, like, this is the, like my physician said, this is what one way that you can regulate it without medication. And, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Walk out. <laughs> Broke a rib and punctured a lung. Walk it off, Jeff. You win. That beats my separated jaw story. That's awesome. Have you walked it off yet, Jeff? Are you okay? Did you heal? Oh, yes. Oh, you guys, this is fun. I, I, I hope that if you're trying to make a comment, you can make a comment. I hope that you're seeing the comments. 
um, because we're having a lot of fun here this morning. Oh my goodness gracious, I've got to get going. Oh yeah, that would be the thing, right, Dave? Like you would check out your, like, your helmet afterwards because they weren't dolled up after every game and you would get the war paint from other teams. You would try to go in head first so you could get that war paint. Oh man, if you could smash your face mask and break one of those screws or something, oh, that was, those were badges of honor. Forget the little stickers on the back of your helmet for these little kids today. Those were the badges of honor. All right, all right, I gotta get going. <laughs> Walk it off, Jeff. Father God, thank you so much for this church. Thank you so much for all of the hearts that are submitted to your will. Lord, we pray that your church this day honors you and does not embarrass you, that we bless you in all that we say and that we do. And we pray that we recognize that we are indeed bonded one to the other. And we care about each other physically, emotionally, and spiritually. There is no greater service that you call us to than to sharing the evangel, the good news, the salvation through Jesus Christ alone. It's in your precious name that we pray, Lord. And everybody said amen. God bless you guys. I love you. Engage with scripture today. You have the freedom to do so or the freedom not to. Use your freedom well.